it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Fernando Rosas to today. So it's a bit improvised, but I didn't prepare. So if I make some <laughs> mistake, I'm sorry. But so Fernando is originally from Chile, and he has a very interesting background, interdisciplinary background, because he he was trained first in music. I think he tried the first career in composition, and then electrical engineering and pure mathematics. I don't know which order it was. I don't think it was in that order. And then he moved to neuroscience. And then in these paths, he came to different countries. He worked already in Belgium, in Asia, and UK. And he now is a lecturer in the University of Sussex, a mathematics department, and also fellow in Imperial College in both in complex systems and in neuroscience. And he found his ways in emergence. So that he will uh, give us uh, his thoughts about emergence. Thanks so much for coming. He stays until tomorrow, so if anyone wants to discuss with him after the talk, he's very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, as Fernando said, I have uh, perhaps too many research interests, but my core interests are in the emergence. So that's why I'm really looking forward to share all of these thoughts with you. And today I want to talk about formal approaches to emergence. So I will explain what do I mean with that and why do I think they are exciting. So if I can, yes. So before starting anything, just want to say that everything I will talk today is not my work, but the work of a organic team, especially these two gentlemen, but also these others and even more. So first of all, to acknowledge this collaboration. So the question of the million dollars, what the hell is emergence? So we all care about emergence and very importantly, we have some intuition. So we think that we can recognize when we see it. So for example, in this case, you see these uh, little, little critters that coordinate together and somehow can you know, work much more efficiently to keep the bigger dog uh, you know, far from distance. So when we see something like that, we, we have a feeling about it. We say, yeah, there is something interesting there to be grabbed. But the, the, the tricky thing is like, OK, I, fine. We have a starting point. We have some intuitions to build up on. But how can we move forward? How can we really capture this? So I, I find it relevant to first delineate the, the philosophical options that we have to start thinking about this, about emergence. And basically, in one extreme, so there are you know a big range of options. But in one extreme, you can take a very reductionist approach to life and say you know everything is physics and everything you see that is not physics is just something that looks like something else, but it's actually just physics. So that is a reasonable option. And then you say you know ducks are actually mechanisms, and the brain is also a mechanism. It's just very small the working parts, but it's the same thing. And in the other extreme, you can go well actually, even if you have the perfect string theory, you will not be able to explain how the hell communism arises. So that's another option. You can say, and you can you simply cannot do that. And that has different flavors. So you could say that impossibility holds in principle. So it's not a matter of our limited intelligence, it's a matter that you just cannot do it, no matter how much computational power you, you cannot do it. And then that leads to this view that we can characterize as strong emergence. And that says that there are some macroscopic features and macroscopic properties that have irreducible causal power over the world. Another option is to say, well, this is only happening in practice. So it looks like that, but it's actually just because of our inability to, to, to do that prediction. And then there are different ways of uh, stating this idea of weak emergence, where we say that the, actually the causal power is always reducible. You can on, always do it in theory. Now, often you cannot do it in practice, but it's a practical problem, it's not a in principle problem. So that's another more sort of a soft way to go about this. Now, if we ask the hard question, like is emergent a reality or is it an illusion? Is it some is a way of talking around it? And then depending on your stance, you will have a different answer. So if you are in reduction, you will say, of course it's not real. If you are a strong emergent, we will say, of course it's real, but in some cases only. And if you're a weak emergent, you will be somewhere in the middle and you will say it, it looks like real, but it's actually kind of not real or something like that. And this is my very contentious 
point of view, I, I, I think that this is a bit of a pillow fight until we specify very precisely what we mean with what the hell is causal power, what the hell is irreducible, and how could we, you know, settle this discussion into a minimal model that we can really understand and, this, and, and, and make decisions on this instead of arguing, uh, you know, in, in, a, in another way. And also, can we measure something? <laughs> So I, I would really like you know to move all these discussions, uh, complement this philosophical discussion with some empirical work, so that we can you know say I have a conjecture about this, but I haven't I don't know the answer, and then data can tell. So that's the plan for today. Basically, what we are going to try to cover today, the first is that I will try to convince you of the strengths of having formal approaches to this question, no approaches to, to emergence, then. Um, I will zoom in into a one specific way of doing that, that is based on something called information decomposition. So I will explain you what is information decomposition and how we can use that in order to quantify emergence. Then we will go to some case studies that how, if, with the tools that we get from point number two, what can we do in neuroscience in particular, just to illustrate the kind of things you can do with this. And at the end, some ideas to take home. So let's, let's do this. So first, where, what, what I'm trying to do, uh, basically, you can think there are these two extreme ways of think of emergence, like some, you know, crazy stuff or some nothing really going on. And my interest is to explore the place in between. So how can, what are the options in between and how much, uh, you know, in, like in math, like uh, how much action you have to put, how much you get out of that, and uh, how, how, how can you navigate that? That space of compatibility where you say there is something that is not purely illusion, but it's also not from emergence, so you can measure things and you don't go crazy. And more specifically, my hope, my goal here is to build a philosophically lightweight, so a simple framework to reason about emergence, where we can formally establish hypotheses about emergence in specific systems of interest, and then we can verify them on data. So that is the, the goal of this program. Now, how can we do it? Uh, also, again, the idea is not to replace philosophy. Philosophy, you have to, we, you have to take stances and things like that. So the idea is to complement philosophy with this uh, mathematical approaches to emergence. And just to say that the maths of emergence are relatively new. So to my knowledge, the first formal, formal approach to measure emergence that I am aware of was published in 2010. Uh, so this is a very recent effort and of course very young and but very exciting. Sorry, can I, yes. I think we lost the camera connection online. Oh. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the camera can be different. I can see you. Are... <laughs> I should unmute her. Now it's again has gone to the. Uh, again, it's gone. Can, uh, can the camera can yeah. Sorry, no worries, no worries. And also a parenthesis, if you have any sort of very concrete question, please interrupt me in any time. And if you have a longer question, uh, let's wait it for, for, for the end, okay. So let me hide this again. Yeah. So what do I think mathematics can contribute to this discussion about the emergence? Uh, specifically, I think it can help us to guide our intuition. So we have intuition, but when we get to complicated cases, like, you know, the brain and consciousness and stuff like that, the, our intuition starts failing. So I really feel that mathematics can help us to, to guide those discussions, not to decide them, but to guide them in a useful way. Then also, as I said before, I think it's very helpful to be able to make very precise conjecture based on precise definitions. And then also it's super nice to be able to test them objectively. So it's not it's like, this is not what I think, this is the data that is supporting this, this conjecture that I had before. So in those ways, I think math can contribute. And to put it in a very simplistic way, I think that philosophy can, the focus of philosophy is to try to figure out the nature of emergence, or what is exactly emergence, what it is. And math in a more pragmatic way can help to say, what is this good for? Like, can we solve questions of interest? Like, can we solve stuff about how the human brain works or AI or you know, different 
questions like that. Can we can can we use it for something useful? And there has been a number of mathematical frameworks that I will review one of them today. And all of them share some similarities in their framing of the problem. Specifically, they consider multivariate systems described by different uh, parts that evolve in time. So you have this measure that P and then P prime. Then you have some macroscopic uh, property of the whole system that is usually assumed to supervene. Supervene in a mathematical way can be defined as P is a function of the micro. And in that way, you, you, you restrict the possible macros that you consider going together with a micro. Then another commonality is that in these approaches, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but these approaches focus on emergence in dynamics. So not so much in a single snapshot of the system, is this emergent or not, more like you consider the dynamics of the system between two time points and you see those dynamics have some emergent property. And I will explain more in detail what I mean with that. And the, the, the last point is that these approaches led us to quantify emergence, and that's nice because it's not a binary thing like yes or no, but it's more like this is more emergent than this other thing. And that also is, is interesting because it opens the door for more, more nuanced uh, ways of thinking of the problem. So these are my three favorite approaches to emergence that have been published recently. So the first was published by Eric Hoel and collaborators in 2013. It's something about controlling a system at a micro level or controlling it at the macro level. And you quantify to the degree of control, basically, at the macro and at the micro. And if this is larger than this, then you, was, you say there is emergence happening. So I'm not going to go into the details, but that's the idea. You, you're trying to control a system. You have a system with inputs and outputs like a keyboard with a lot of little keys or, or a few big keys and you start pressing them and you see how much control of the system you can have with the two keyboards. And you measure that and you see if there is emergency, the bigger, the, the, the keyboard with less keys control better the system. That's basically the situation. A second option that is the one I will focus more in detail is about whole versus parts. So for example, you have a flock of birds and, and, and you wonder if the whole flock as a, as, as a whole entity has something more than the parts. And let's put it at that level. I'm, I'm going to sum in, in very much detail what does that mean and how can we measure that. The third option is about the sufficiency of the macro. So let's say you have a micro system doing something. You have a macro description, a simplified description of the system. And you want to study the evolution of the macro and you wonder if the macro would be sufficient in the sense that you don't need to see the micro to learn something. For example, I press a keyboard, a key in my keyboard, I get something in the screen, and I don't care about the states of the electrons in the keyboard when I press. It only matters where I press, and that's it. So by seeing the, 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 the smaller part, uh, I don't gain more relevant information for predicting the macro output. That, that's the, the gist of, of it. So my point here are two points. These are three ways of measuring emergence. There are sort of different aspects. They are not really competing with each other. They are providing different perspectives over something with a similar flavor. That's one point. And the second point is all, all of these things are, you know, math. It's something you measure from data and you can see if these things are significantly larger than zero or not. And then you can say yes or, or no. So all these theories are correct in the sense that they are not uh, they are logically consistent there is no nothing magical about this and the key question for me is what can we do with those and i mean how can you interpret exactly what they are capturing and what can you use them for in, in practice and as i said before uh, the rest of the presentation i will focus on the second because it's the one i know the best and but i i hope that will illustrate how this type of approaches can go forward and what can you do with them. So let's go into the detail of this specific way of quantifying emergence. So mariology, I don't know if you have ever heard that word before, is about um, parts versus whole things. And this, this perspective on emergence is to study the relationship between the parts and the whole. And an informal definition could be Emergence in this sense is when the whole exhibit properties that cannot be traced down to the parts. And we are going to, and the question is, how the hell can you measure that? So 
We took inspiration in this seminal paper from 1994, I think, from these three neuroscientists. And these are about the brain. And they were saying the human brain seems to have something very special. That is, the human brain is differentiated. You have different brain regions doing different things. And at the same time, they are working together. So they are integrated. And the key insight from this paper that I don't think has been highlighted enough and it's also not explicitly made in such in a strong way, but the key point for me is that these things are not antagonist. So our feeling would be, okay, there is these two competitive forces and you have to trade off them in a smart way. And my claim is no. My claim is the brain gets these two things for free at the same time without competition. And you say, why? Well, that, that sounds weird. And we call that synergy when that happens, that integration and differentiation happen at the same time. So you could say, I don't get that, that doesn't make sense, and I would agree with you because it's a bit counterintuitive, but this is a nice geometric illustration of that, how could that be? So these are called the Borman rings, these are three rings, and you can see they are entangled, so you cannot take them apart if you try, but if with your imagination you take the green ring out of the picture, you can see that the red and the blue go apart, and if you take the blue, the red and the green go apart. So this is a geometrical relationship that is triple, that cannot be explained as a summation of pairwise relationships. These rings are not linked at the pairwise level, they are linked at the triple level. And my claim is this is integrated and differentiated because the whole thing is one thing, you cannot put it apart, but when you see the, the subparts of this thing, they are, they are not entangled. So they have a global entanglement, but not a local entanglement. So they have freedom while having cohesion at the same time. So this is a geometrical inspiration. And the question then is, how can we measure this in data? And for that comes information theory. And with this, I will give you a crash course on something called information decomposition. That is the thing we use to quantify this. So what is synergy from an information theoretical point of view and how can we measure it? So for that, let me put you a cartoonish example that I find very helpful for explaining synergy. Let's say you had your favorite cookies in a jar in your kitchen, and you wake up in the morning and you want to get the cookie and the, the jar is empty and you are very angry. So you hire a detective to find who was the person that took the cookies from the cookie jar. And there are nine sus suspects. So the, the, the Sherlock has to find who was the culprit. And there are two witnesses. And they're going to provide different information about who ate your cookies. So the first witness says the culprit was wearing a must mustache. And with that, you rule out half of the culprit, uh, of the suspects, and you end up with four. And the first witness also say the, the, the person that took the cookies was wearing a hat. So then you're good because this, you're only between two, almost there. Now you go with the second witness, and the second witness says, yes, I agree. He was wearing a mustache. And then on top of that, the second witness say it was also a red hat. So as you can say, by having the two witnesses together, you can find the culprit, but you couldn't have done it by having any of them separately. So we say that the, the mustache was a redundant information given by both. In model of human psychology, but <laughs> let's make it simple. Like this information was given by both sources, so that's redundant. You could have found, found that in both places, basically. Then there was something unique given by each of them, but there was something synergistic given by both. I mean, there was something that you can access only because you had both at the same time, and you couldn't have accessed that thing if you have one and not the other or that way around. So that is what we call synergy in information theory. And luckily enough, there are some very smart mathematics to measure this. And this is called the partial information decomposition. The idea is that, I don't know if you're familiar with information theory, but this is the mutual information between the two witnesses and, and, the, and the culprit. This is called the chain pool of the information. So you say this information is equal to the information provided by the first witness, plus the information provided by the second, conditioned on what was given by the first. That is classic information theory. And the information decomposition is one step further and to say this first term actually can be decomposed in two, redundancy plus unique, and the second term is also two things, the unique of the second plus the synergy of both. 
And then you start having a lot of mathematics that I'm, I'm not going to present here. You end up with some pretty lattices like this, where you have the redundancy here, the cleavage and the synergy on top. And the synergy is, my claim is, this is what captures the property of being, you know, um, more than the sum of the parts. This extra thing that you get when you have the whole thing, but not, but you cannot find that in the parts. Excellent. So all that is very pretty, but for example, I, I do brain analysis and in brain analysis, you don't have a single culprit. It's a much more complicated situation because you have multivariate type series from the different brain regions and everything is affecting everything. So how can you apply this framework in this situation? It looks a bit complicated because the previous framework, you need to have one target. Although you accept multiple sources of information, you're all the time thinking of one target. And here there is no single target, everything is a target and everything is a source, so it's complicated. But uh, so just to say again, PID, partial information decomposition, considers this scenario. So you can consider a multivariate target, but you cannot consider those as two entities. This doesn't work in standard partial information decomposition, but we, we try to solve that by extending the framework to something we call integrated information decomposition. That is the extension of partial information decomposition to time series, where you allow multiple sources, that means multiple witnesses, but also multiple culprits. And you can decompose uh, this, the this general situation. And how does this work in a very cartoonish way? You have two time series here. You think of the, the joint future as a single target, and you have two sources, so you have PAD redundancy, unique, unique and synergy, you think the same thing but backwards. So having the two futures of single sources and the whole past as a single target, and you have another way of decomposing the, this is the information coming from the whole thing. And you have another PID divided in a different way. And then the magic is basically getting the product. And then you have all the possible combinations going from redundancy to redundancy, going from redundancy to unique, and you have you move from four and four to sixteen possibilities. So basically, this gives you a more complicated lattice like this. Remember the the square lattice in PID that was super simple. Here, for two time series, you get this. I, I mean, it's complicated, but it's, I, I think it's pretty. Sixteen atoms. Each of these atoms is a different type of dynamics. And what we're doing here is, is, a, is a cartography of the different types of dynamics that you can have between two side time series. And these are 16. Each of these is a type of dynamic. There are 16, and there are all the combinations between possible past uh, redundancy, unique or synergy, and future redundancy, unique or synergy. And to explain a bit more what, how can you interpret this, some of these modes of information correspond to storage. So, for example, something was in the time series one and it stays in time series one in a unique way. That is a storage in the first place. You can be redundant before and then you keep being redundant after. That is redundant storage. So, you have some atoms that correspond to redundancy. And the topmost atom is that you were synergistic before and you stay synergistic in the future. So, it's a synergistic storage that I will, we will talk more about that later. You also have copy. So, for example, you could be unique in the past and be redundant in the future. That, that means you copy that information from being in one place to being in both places. You could, you could transfer. You were in the first and you in a unique way, and now you are in the second in a unique way. So that is pure transfer. You could erase information. You were redundant, and now you are unique either in one or two. So all of this sort of makes some sense. And there are different types of, of, of move information in a dynamical way. Uh, this, um, I'm, uh, I will explain more in detail this, but this corresponds to downward causation. I will explain how. And just to wrap up all this, the idea is that this provides this uh, map where we can compare different measures of complex um, dynamical complexity. I don't know if you're familiar, for example, with transfer entropy. Transfer entropy is something that tries to capture how this affects the other. And we find that transfer entropy is actually four things together. So you can decompose and really understand what is transfer entropy capturing. There are some results of transfer entropy that make little sense, 
And with this, you understand how. That's why this is happening. Or there are some measures of integrated information. I don't know if you're familiar with IIT, some years of course on that, that sometimes also give you weird results and you can understand this. So this is sort of a, the way we think of this is like a periodic table of dynamics. And with that, you can make much more sense of previous measures and also you can build new measures. So excellent. That's that's the internet, sir. That's information dynamics. Yes. So when you said the relative entropy, do you mean that these have been clustered as relevant to the relative entropy that they have with respect to each other? So these are the ones that are having the least relative entropy with respect to each other? Is that what you mean? Uh, no, I, I didn't so mention I relative entropy. Oh, okay. Well, I yeah, I mean transfer entropy. Transfer entropy. Oh, yes. I'm researching. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Sorry. No worries. Okay. The transfer entropy is this popular measure of information yeah. transfer. And, and the idea is that instead of being one single thing, you can decompose, understand it as the summation for more elementary things. Sorry. We lost the video. Again? Again? Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, is that weird? Yeah. Please yeah. let me know when it happens. Out. I can, yeah, I'm sorry. About no worries at all. Okay, so that's the story about information decomposition. And now the question is, how can we use that to formalize the methods? So we come back to this basic framework. We have a multivariate time series. So a system made of different parts, which could be different birds in a flock or different brain regions or whatnot. They are evolving in time and we're measuring some property of them. Could be the center of mass, could be their average activity, could be the modularity, could be anything. And then we see how that macroscopic property is evolving in time as well. And then my claim is that we can use the integrated information decomposition, this lattice that I was showing before, in order to show to, to identify two types of emergence. One is we're going to call downward causation, and that means in this case the past of the macro determines the future of the mic of some part in a way that cannot be done from the parts so let's say the whole flock determines a bit of the future of individual birds in a way that individual birds don't okay. that, that is downward causation or for example the you know the effect of current economy um, determines the state of your future saving account in, in the future something like that and then the interesting thing is that the, this framework I will show distinguishes another type of emergence that we call causal decoupling, where the macroscopic property seems to predict itself in a way that the micro don't predict. And that is the coupling because it's like, imagine, for example, the flock of birds as a whole predict itself in a way that from the birds, single birds, you cannot predict. So it's sort of taking its own life and doing its own thing, basically. So that, th those are the intuitions. Now, how can we can quantify this? We start with a definition, formal definition. We say a supervening variable V, a macro variable, exhibit causal emergence with respect to this uh, uh, micro, if and only if there is unique information measured in PID, in partial information decomposition. We know how to measure this. If there is unique information from the, from the past of the macro to the future of the micro. So there is some unique predictive power of the macro about the future of the micro that is not given by the, the, the parts of the system at time t, but when the parts are considered separately. And, and this is a subtle thing, because if you consider the parts together, you know the state of the macro, because the macro is a function of the micro. So there is nothing more there. To be gained. So there is no information that the macro could give that is not given in all the micro together. But this conditioning is on each of them by themselves, not together. And that's a key part. So, for example, in a flock of birds, you're not considering the states of all the birds together, but separate, one at a time. And if the flock gives you stuff that the birds by themselves don't give you, then you're in business. That is the story. And then, uh, oh, this is the same, sorry for that. So this is the formal definition of causal emergence in this framework. 
And the nice thing is that then you can start doing mathematics because now we have a definition. This is the condition and we can start cranking the integrated information decomposition framework and see what can we get. And we get three theorems that are the, the, the core of this theory. The first is that a system possesses at least one feature that is causally emergent, if and only if the dynamics are synergistic. What is the meaning of this? Before we had a B, we had a candidate that we think this is emerging. But sometimes we don't know. We, we don't know exactly what could be emerging. We just have you know, brain regions and we have no idea what could be this collective property that we think is emerging. And this tell us, well, actually it doesn't matter. There is an intrinsic property of the micro that tells you if, if there exists some property that is emergent, even if you don't know which it is. And that is that there has to be synergy in the sense that I said before. There has to be synergy between the parts in order to predict themselves in the future. So that is nice because it allows you to work on situations where you don't know the, tar the, 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 the macro that holds the emergent thing. This, this tells you there exists one, it doesn't tell you how to find it. But it's still very helpful. Yes. So there is the mathematical definition of synergy? Yes. There is a there are formulas how to measure it. Yeah. Then uh, building on theorem one, where we are identifying emergence with synergy, because that is not a definition, it's not that we're defining emergence to be equal to synergy. It's a we're defining it as unique information from this macro thing, but we are proving that this is equivalent to synergy. So now if we take that equivalence, we can do more math and we can show that this synergy is equal to two things that are basically two parts of this lattice of the, the PID, the partial information decomposition, this atom and these two, three atoms here. And the first one, you can identify it with with the causal decoupling, that is when you have a macro thing that predicts itself better than the parts. And these three terms here, you can identify it with double causation that that means when there is unique information from these to single parts of this. So that is nice because you're, you're finding these two modes of emergence in a mathematical way. It's not that you take it from your pocket, the mathematics are guiding you in that direction. And the first theorem, says that okay this is all pretty but usually it's very hard to compute i would not deny that but we there are some shortcuts and for example there are more shortcuts in the paper but this is the more important one if you want to guarantee the this condition that is the the definition for emergence there is this practical criteria that if this works this works so this is a practical way to assess emergence and how does it work you have a candidate macro. So for example, you have a flock of birds and you can take the center of mass of the flock of birds. And you study the, basically the autocorrelation of the center of mass. So how much the center of mass predict the future center of mass. And you get a number like 50%. And then you study how much each of the birds separately predict the center of mass. And one predict 1%, the other 3%, and the other 4%. You get a different predictive power. And then you sum this up, and that is the predictive power of the parts over the, the macro. And then you compare these two things. And if the macro predicts itself better than the sum of the predictive power of the micro over the macro, then you're good to go. Does it make sense? So, and, and the beauty of this criterion is that it's fairly simple to compute. You can do it even in, in relatively big systems. So we have some examples with the game of life where you can have 100 cells and properties and 100 agents and you can still run it. You don't run into the course of dimensionality that you die very quickly with these two. And the other is that, um, the other nice thing is that it might mis misdetect sometimes. So sometimes there is emergent and you don't see it because the criterion only works in one direction. But at least if this works, you can be sure that this works. So it's only one direction, but it's the direction I would choose if I have to choose one, right? So this allows us to start doing practical analysis, which is great. So one example, this is a, I don't know if you're familiar with the Reynolds plotting model. 
So these are uh, abstraction of a flock of birds where each bird is a little arrow and there are different parameters and there is like how much they are aligned to each other, how much they repel each other. So in, in, we are playing with the avoidance parameter. In this case, this is a very strict, very ordered flock of birds, which is not very interesting, as you can see. So they just spin around themselves. And the macro, the candidate for macro is the center of mass, is uh, you know, the dynamics of the center of mass. In this other extreme, we have crazy birds doing whatever they want. And it's very random. And the center of mass is also doing whatever it wants. In the other case, the center of mass was fixed. Here it is all very chaotic. And in the middle, you have some interesting dynamics where there is some cohesion, but not so much. So the, each bird is relatively, you know, very hard to predict, but the center of mass is much more predictable. And if you do some analysis on this, uh, this is again the, the, the three cases. In this case, the dynamics of the central mass are pretty boring. Here are everything very crazy, and here you have much more consistency than the parts. If you do a sweep, parameter sweep, you can see that the criterion of emergence is satisfied for the middle cases. What, what does that mean? That means that the center of mass predicts itself better than what is predicted by individual birds. That is, and in that sense, we would say there is emergence going on in this example. Yes, but but it's tricky because, for example, if if your system is is very synchronized, you can also predict the future of the macro from each of the parts. And for example, in this case, here you could equate this with a very strong coupling, and then that doesn't is not emergent in this criteria. So, so it's a bit subtle because if you have very strong synchronization, you can predict the average from any part, and then, and then you are not. Uh, then the macro has nothing that co couldn't be found in the parts. You need some balance in where the macro has something that the parts cannot give you. And this is uh, another example from from brains. These are macaque cortical activity from ECOG data, so intracortical electrodes and the macaque is doing a grabbing task so we have 64 channels and we have the hand position of the macaque that is doing something so what we did is that we did an estimation of the monkey's wrist position from the uh, eco channels and we asked if, if that estimation was emergent from the parts so here we have the 64 channels doing something the um, the blue, I think the blue is the real position of the hand, and the orange is the estimation that we are making from the channels about the position. So the, the estimation of the hand position would correspond to the feature that we believe is could be or could not be emergent. So the question then is, is the position of the hand as represented in the 64 channels based on this reconstruction we're making? Is that what qualifies as emergent from our criterion or not? And the answer is yes. And what does it mean in this case? That would mean that from the 64 channels, if you try to predict the position of the hand from individual channels, you get nothing. So it's not coded in one channel. But if you try to do it in the 64, you do a pretty good job. So it's sort of encoded everywhere, but nowhere. But that would be the interpretation. So these are all sort of um, test cases. Now let's go a bit more in detail to what can you do in the human brain with, with these tools. So what can this, all these tools, all these fancy tools can tell us about the human brain? We did, uh, um, we did a study using the HCP data, the Human Connection Project. And I'm, I'm going to explain you the pipeline of the analysis we did. So we took the data, we parcelated in Shaffer 200, I think, and then you have the time series of each of these 200 brain regions. This is resting state, so subjects are not doing anything. So you have the 200 time series moving together. And then what we did is that uh, in that case, we didn't have an idea of what could be the emergent property. We didn't know if the center of mass is the, is the what. Then we have done more things, but back then we had no clue what could be the emergent property? So then we use this uh, theorem that says syner dynamical synergy is equivalent to emergence. So then we measure 
the topmost atom, the, the cost of the coupling atom for each pair of regions. And then we also measure the redundancy to redundancy atom in each pair of regions. So, and, and with that, basically, you have an, uh, a network of redundancies that would mean you have 200 nodes that are the brain regions, and the connection strength would be the redundancy to redundancy strength of that dynamic. And then you have a synergy network that is based on the synergy to synergy that again is, is very strongly related with cost of the coupling. Okay, so that was the first step of the, uh, of the study to do that for each subject of the HCP of the 100 subjects and get these two networks. Then we took these two networks and we sum over the rows to get some sort of strength of each of the nodes based on either synergy slash emergence or redundancy. Then we ranked both of them, the rank of redundancy and the rank of synergy, and then we took the rank difference. And with that, we wanted to get a um, gradient that could go from synergy to redundancy in brain dynamics and see what the hell could we get out of that. And lo and behold, this is the way it looks, the rank. I don't know how much you know about brains, but uh, this is nice because you're just measuring this property and you find a very strong differentiation between brain regions. So for example, the motor sensory motor cortex that is here in between, like this, this looks very blue. That means it's very strong in redundancy. And then all the frontal cortices, this part, also here the procurement and all that, that's very synergistic. So that's nice because it's very strongly divided between things that we know that have very different roles in brain function. Then we did the, the same analysis, but separated by resting state networks. If you are familiar, resting state networks are supposed to characterize uh, how brain, different brain regions coordinate to do different things. So for example, the DNN, the whole most network that is supposed to be related with um, autobiographical, uh, the sense of self and stuff like that, is significantly synergistic. The sensory motor is significantly redundant. The, um, what else? The, the front operator is also very much in the synergistic side. So in general, it seems that synergy is dominated by networks that are related with high level functions like the DMN on the, of the front operator. And the, that redundancy is very much dominant in sensory motor areas in general. Then we also did this uh, neurosynth meta-analysis that, uh, that is that here you have the, um, the gradient and here you have different categories of things and the way this works is that you can associate the papers that talk about this and if they mention the region in question or not and then you see that there is this natural very nice diagonal where in this part you have auditory processing motor uh, like uh, lower level processing here and then you go all the way to more complicated things like numerical cognition social cognition work memory so also this type of analysis seems to support this idea that synergy is related with high level cognition. Then also we study the networks that you get with, from synergy and redundancy. And you see that the efficiency of the network, that means how easy it is to navigate from one point to the network to the other. The synergy network is super efficient, the redundancy network is super inefficient. And conversely, the redundancy network is very modular and the synergy network is very non-modular, so it's very not separated in chunks, but it's very well connected. Then we compared both synergy and redundancy networks with the connectome, with the structural connections, and the redundancy is much more similar to the physical connections than the synergy, which is also interesting because it suggests that the redundancy follows the, the wires, while the synergy is, is something more decoupled something less less constrained by physiology then also we compare with monkeys and we did the same analysis of monkeys and we measure how much redundancy and how much synergy you have in monkeys and interestingly we found that redundancy between humans and macaques is very similar but the synergy is very different so then you can start speculating that perhaps redundancy has to do with survival you know efficient input and output and arguably we both humans and monkeys need the same type of those mechanisms but in contrast the, the synergy if it's related with cognition 
there might be a big difference between humans and monkeys. And that is what's being suggested here. Also, we study areas of cortical expansion from chimps to macaques, as in this axis. This is the redundant circuit synergy gradient, and there is a significant correlation between, and that suggests areas that have expanded more in evolution from monkeys to humans then are in the synergistic side of the gradient. And also we study a gene expression of these um, genes that are specific from humans in contrast with monkeys, and there is also a correlation, meaning that the areas that are in the gradient side in the synergy side of the gradient tend to have more of these genes than, than the redundant ones. So all of this is converging evidence, of course, is, 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 is nice. That is all sort of suggesting in the same direction. However, you will well argue that this is all observational. This is not causal. We are not able to, you know, come in the brain, change the genes and see what happens. But we can play with the eye. And we are starting to do that. We have a recent preprint posted here and the idea here is to have AI systems that are trained in different ways and then you can break them or you can train, change the way of training and you can see if this similar properties hold or not. So here we have neural networks solving two types of decision making tasks, decision task one or two, which are very different with each other and there is a variation where you can have some contextual information. So basically we have four tasks, these two are very similar. These two are very similar and like this, they're very different. And then we, we tested what happened if we train the neural network to learn these tasks either sequentially or interleaved. And then we ask how much uh, the performance we get out of this and how much synergy we get out of this. And lo and behold, if you train it to similar tasks, either sequentially or interleaved, is all pretty good in terms of accuracy, but the synergy is low. But if you try, and um, this is uh, sequential, if you try different things sequentially, they don't work so well and there is not so much synergy. But you try different tasks in an interleaved way, you get accuracy and you get synergy. So that's nice. It's suggesting that synergy is also is related with this flexible learning. And so instead of sort of overfitting to one thing, you try to keep flexible to solve both. And then the, the fact that you're using the same resources to different things that tell us that synergy is going on. So this is supportive of the, of the whole story. Of course, there, there's much more to be done and we're working on that, but this is one way of having more causal evidence of this, of this relationship. Okay, so in summary, the, everything suggests that redundancy would be related with input output in the brain. So sensory motor, you know, the lion is coming, have to run, that has that thing has to work, it cannot, it cannot break down. So that is good to have, you know, redundancy there. But in contrast, the things that are more ambitious or, uh, that can fail, but you know, more subtle, like, like um, higher cognitive functions, seem to be related with this type of synergistic dynamics that are, as we saw before, related with emergent behavior. So I'm running out of time, so I will, I will present a little bit of this. So everything before was about cognition. And I'm personally very, very interested in human consciousness, so we have also done a little bit in that direction. I will, I will, expl I will present this very quickly. So here we have some analysis on, again, the HCP, and then some subjects with anesthesia and some subjects with disorders of consciousness. We presented an architecture of brain dynamics in the brain. The idea was we have the world and you perceive the world and by specialized modules, and then they go sometimes into this global workspace. The idea of the global workspace is a place where all the information between the specialized models will be shared. And then sometimes this something is, is broadcast from here. It goes back to specialized models that are responsible for action, and then the action goes to the world, and then this keeps circulating. So that, that is sort of the cycle of information between the world and, and the brain. And, and our interest was to try to operationalize this. So how does this looks how is the types of information dynamics what type of dynamics are this what type of dynamics are this what types of dynamics are this 
and we make some I did some conjectures. So maybe the dynamic, the way this is processed here is by synergy, and then the, the workspace would be divided between gateways, ways in, and broadcasters, ways out. And the, the way we operationalize this in our first step, this is not, of course, the final answer, but it was our first approach, was to say, well, if you are a hub in the synergy network, you would be, be a gateway. And if you are having the redundancy network, you will be a broadcaster. And then we also wonder about consciousness when it's lost, and we thought it could be measured in terms of integrated information. That is one of these measures of uh, dynamical complexity. So the, the first thing we found that is super interesting is that this um, the workspace was identified to be the DMN and the executive network, the front operator, this is in a data-driven way. And if you if we divide this in terms of the hubs of the synergy network and the hubs of the redundancy network, it just appeared that the DMN seemed to be the way in and the front operator seemed to be the way out. And this was from a data-driven thing, but it matched super nicely what we know about the brain. So this was really exciting to, to find this. And then we also saw that in case of loss of consciousness, the main differences were found in the DMN and not so much in the front operator. So, and that suggests that the, uh, the episodes of loss of consciousness would be related with failures of going into the workspace, which, which is an interesting conjecture that then can lead you know, to speculation and future experiments. So that is uh, one way of approaching the question. Another appro approach that we have taken is a recent preprint, but it was accepted like the last week, I think, uh, this we were measuring uh, this is the, the whole emergence thing so the sum of these two things instead of focusing only here we were taking the sum on the patients with DLC with disorders of consciousness disorders of consciousness means like a like big brain damage and then we measure that quantity in every pair of brain regions for people with um, vegetative state minim minimally conscious and controls and you see that there's this capacity to emerge the synergy. This is the capacity to have emergent features. It goes down with the, with, the, with the condition. And then we could reproduce that with whole brain modeling. So whole brain modeling is a way that you can have a big model of the whole brain and you can change different things. So what we did here is that we use the connectomes from either the controls or the subjects with minimally conscious states or with vegetative condition. And then the dynamics are changed, and then we measure this thing, and we could reproduce the same findings, which is a, it's a way of supporting in a more in a more causal way this these claims. So I think that's it. Yes, we're almost done. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's just finalize this with some key ideas. So the first idea I would like you to take home is that formal approaches to emergence are very cool, are very exciting and promising. And why? Because I, I believe they, they help us to better reason about emergence, you know, to ground the things. And, you know, if we want to fight, we can fight about very concrete things. That, 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 I think that's very helpful. That, that is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that if, if we provide researchers with quantitative tools, to, it's very useful because they, then they can frame conjectures about emergence. So instead of saying the brain is emergent, you can say, well, maybe the, this specific modality in this situation will display emergent phenomena in this way. So you can frame that conjecture and then you can go to the data and see if that works or not. So it's a way to, 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 to bring the, the whole idea to, is to bring emergence a bit more to empirical work. Then just as a, as a case study, I showed some recent results that were using ideas inspired on these mathematical frameworks of emergence, and we can see how these are revealing new ways to probe how the brain might support consciousness or cognition or things like that. Of course, this is very complicated, and these are just first steps. And that's my last point that say this is all very exciting, but there's a lot more to be done. So uh, yeah, I hope just to transmit some of the excitement of this, and thank you very much for your patience in hearing me all this time. Again, thank you, my collaborators, and that's all from me. Thank you very much. Before
before I forget, if anyone wants the slides, uh, you can email me later and I will be more than happy to, to share those with you. Cool, thanks a lot. Amazing talk. And uh, do you have any questions for Hernan? <coughs> Uh, very interesting, and what a question I asked, maybe more, uh, not exactly scientific, but I know they talk about the brain, one part is the left side, which is more analytical, and one side is more feeling, but can I imagine something about, like, can we quantify the your foods, basically? I think we could, I don't think that will work, <laughs> because that left-right division is, uh, I mean, I mean, there are some differences, like you have, you know, the language area that is not in that side, stuff like that. But uh, usually those things are much more complicated when you get into the details. So, I mean, I mean, yes, you could make a conjecture about that and you could say if uh, you have a subject involved in an emotional task, maybe you will have more emergence in the right and it's in the left or something. So absolutely, you could use these tools to make conjectures about that. Um, uh, Personally, I, th I would be surprised if, if that conjecture works, but I, it would be great if it works. Because <laughs> yeah, I tried to check that. Ah. So that uh, if you're left-handed, right-handed, then you have more action. Okay. It's not symmetric. Like when you see a drawing, the brain is symmetric, but in reality, it's not symmetric. And very often, if you're right-handed, uh, your motor areas on the left side are stronger in these cartoons. So there are multiple ways to infer that. And, uh, one of these joint work, this is the helps that went last year. We kind of observed that, but the ACP never gave out the handness. Like, I think we have that. So this, I think we could try. I'm not sure we can find it, but I think it's. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting point because yeah. also the question is how you, you can connect the two parts better to be optimal and they can say something interesting. I have a theoretical question. Uh, so first of all, thanks so much, that's very nice. But from the beginning of your talk, you, you mentioned about the, uh, this principle that was created in, in uh, neuroscience like uh, 20 years ago on uh, integration and segregation. And it, it was a nice idea, but it somehow I, I feel that you can have both at the same time. And so in the framework, is there a way that you target, okay, I can check this, is happening both at the same time? Yeah, I th in my view, synergy is measuring that because you can only have synergy if you have a, like, yeah, I, I have a nice example with the music of Bach that I didn't present today, but I find that is very illustrative. So we did some studies uh, on, on, on the scores of Bach chorales. I don't know if you're familiar, so Bach wrote a lot of music for four voices and the four voices are singing together, but they sing they are relatively independent to each other, so when you hear them, you can identify each of the four, but at the same time, they are sort of singing together. So then we measure this and we got a lot of synergy from that, that, those scores. And the interpretation is that if you know one voice, you cannot predict the other voice. So they are, they are perilously almost independent. But if you know the three, you can guess the fourth almost perfectly. Because you can achieve differentiation, you can achieve voices singing independent things very easily. You put random notes and each of them are going to be very unique in what they're contributing to the music. But it's not going to sound very nice because they are random sounds, right? So how can you have this global cohesion, so everybody working together, but at the same time, nobody doing what the other is doing, but having relative independence between each other. That is exactly what synergy is measuring. So in that sense, my, uh, in my view, synergy is capturing when you have this global uh, constraints, if you want to call them, like global um, links, but not local links. And I would interpret that as integration because everything is integrated, but differentiation at the same time because at the low level they are independent. Actually, I have a question about this because coming from a physics perspective, I mean, I work in active matter, so uh, we are in emergent patterns. Yes. But we also try to measure them in terms of interparticle interactions. So yeah. we don't, I, I mean, you look at statistically, I don't care about exact orientation or position of every particle is. Yes. But I care a little like center of mass motion or mm -hmm. global polarization. Yes. But this is usually governed by the type of activity you have or interactions. Mm -hmm. So the nature of interactions matter, but how exactly every two particles interact doesn't matter. So yes, yes. 
but I don't see anywhere in your discussion about the interaction between the, your agents or particles. Well, we that wasn't a super interesting. So there was a paper in Nature Physics uh, two years ago that was called something about high order something. And it was all about high order mechanisms, like Hamiltonians with, a, for example, a Kuramoto model with a triple interaction or things like that. Yeah. And then they were showing that you have explosive phase transitions, a lot of things. And, and there was nothing about synergy or things like that. And we were wondering, like, how these two things relate? And after a lot of struggle, we came to the realization that in one hand, you have mechanisms like interactions, something like that. And in the other hand, you have this that is more like the patterns that you observe. And the first intuition is that they should be together. So if you have low order mechanisms, you should have low order interactions. And if you have higher order mechanisms, you should have, you know. But the, we found counter examples that you can, you can get, for example, you can have an icing model that is a pairwise mechanism with frustration, and then you have synergy. If you don't have frustration, you don't have synergy, it seems. So, and so then it means that you could have low level mechanisms that nevertheless generate high order um, patterns or behaviors, we call it in, in, in a paper we wrote. And, and that connection is, I think, is a big open question in, in this field. Like how exactly can you do the mapping? For example, if you, if you observe like here, high order um, patterns, you cannot guarantee that they are coming from a high order mechanism. No, that's necessarily not from the point that you need yeah. complex interactions to get something. Exactly, it's exactly. Not, uh, you need some minimal ingredients. So, at least of physics is reductionism, so we don't want to have. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, and I'm in the same boat. So, but one thing that we are striving for, but it's, it's really hard, is to have sort of an inverse uh, procedure in order to, to how to identify the simple mechanism that could have given rise to the patterns that you observe. That is something we're looking for, but it is, it's not easy. <laughs> there are two examples, one on social dynamics, all the dynamics being pairwise but non-linear, you get high order behavior. Yeah. And I think one of the work of, that you participate on the whole brain modeling, everything is pairwise but the observation is high order. Yeah, yeah. This one, yeah. Yeah, this is the aim. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so understanding that connection is an open question we all have. Because another thing about frustration is also a lot depends on the initial conditions. So something of dynamism comes into the system. So. Mm. Yeah, and another point related with statistical physics is that all the, fra the framework that I review here and also the other one that I mentioned is very dynamical in the yeah. sense that you're measuring, you know, one condition, the other condition, how you move from one to another. Uh, if you have phase transition in equilibrium, that is completely different. Yeah. And I'm not saying that is not emergent, that is also emergent, but it's a different type of emergence. But active matter by nature is out of equilibrium, so it's like... A, yes, yes. Um, but one, um, one thing that we are trying also is to, to build frameworks that can encompass all these types of emergence. Because uh, part of our claim is that emergence is not a single thing, it's more of a cluster of properties that usually go together, but sometimes they don't. And then how to identify which of those properties and and because another thing I don't like is that sometimes people simply identify collective phenomena with emergence. And I don't think that's very helpful because we, we have the word collective phenomena. Why do you want to call it emergent? So I would like to think that emergence is a specific type of collective phenomena. And for example, synchronization in general, I tend not to think of it as an emergent phenomenon. Synchronization is just um, a collective thing where things get synchronized, but it's not that uh, there is something emergent there. And unless someone convinced me, no, this is a way of saying this that emerges in this sense, and then I would be happy, but I don't see it right now. I mean, maybe your tools can help. Well, the, the, the framework I presented uh, would, I think, would not say that strong synchronization is emergent. Maybe some chimera states or something in between, yes, but like strong synchronization, I, I think, would not work. But maybe other maybe other frameworks would 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 tell that emergence. So uh, I'm trying to argue for a very pluralistic view on emergence, where it's a bit like what happened with complexity. You know, in complexity, in the very beginning, people thought complexity is one thing. We just need to find the right formula, and now we gave up and we say complexity is actually a bunch of different things. And as long as you know exactly what you're talking about, that's good. So with emergence, I, I think of the same. Like as long as you you can specify what do you mean exactly with emergence, then 
Thank you. 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 You know, like a formula that, that's related to something. It, it looked a bit like information of the of the whole minus the information given by the parts on the whole. Yes. Um, and but in the beginning, you were speaking about uh, strong immersions versus weak immersion. Yes. Like, so is there like a scale you can divide define on relating to your definition of causal immersion that could tell you like. This is emergence, but it's weak or it's stronger, or yeah, that's, that's something so that black and white, like, yeah. or is there something in between? That, that's an excellent, strong. that's a really good question. We're, we're, we're writing something about that now. Um, now, let me put it simple. Uh, the problem is that there are two ways of thinking of weak emergence, one way is is to say anything that is not crazy is weak emergence. <laughs> like if you are magical, you know, dualistic, that's strong emergence, and anything that is not like that is weak emergence. And then in that sense, yes, I'll put it weak. But if you are a bit more precise with what you mean with weak emergence, and you are more like denying downward causation, for example, or or addressing there is one famous definition that is um, this is related with computational irreducibility. Like a weak emergence is a system that is any physical system, but you cannot really predict what will happen. You have to run it. So there is no explanatory shortcut to get to the future. You have to run it. Uh, seller, some seller for, for example, that, that is one definition of weak emergence. In that sense, our thing is not weak because it doesn't follow that principle. So, so I would try to, my, my personal position is to avoid the weak versus strong because I find that the weak is too weak and the strong is too strong. <laughs> and that our approaches are a bit in the middle. And to some extent, we're trying to recover features that are usually associated with strong, but, but without being strong in the ontological way. So to try to see, can we instantiate downward causation in a reasonable way? Or you know, trying to see how far we can go by... Uh, for me, the key thing that we never should should let go is supervenience. You know, when at the moment you say I allow any macro that is not supervenience and the micro means is not a coarse gradient, then you are opening the door to any strange thing. So as long as you restrict yourself to consider macro properties that are just coarse gradient, then I think we're if that means to be weak, then I'm weak. <laughs> if if by weak you mean more than that, then I'm not weak. Like the thing is that you have your definition basically based on an inequality. Yeah. So if it's larger than zero, you call it immersion. Yes. So, it, but of course, the, the, the measure that you have will just give you a number. Yes. Which can be larger or smaller. Yes. Uh, in the cases you study, like, is it, uh, is that all in a similar kind of range or? Is there a differentiation also between, you know, sort of processes you would you would sooner relate relate to to being strongly emergent, give larger number, or causal emergent? Yeah, that's another excellent question. Uh, the thing is, uh, the the actual unique information, I'll, I will take it as an effect size of emergence. So I would take it seriously, thinking this is more emergent than this other because this is larger. The problem is that in general, we cannot measure that directly. And then we rely on this practical criterion. That is, we can show that if one is satisfied, I is satisfied, but I'm not sure, I don't think there is a monotonic relationship between both. So if you have two systems and in the practical criterion, this is larger than this, I don't think you can guarantee that the actual thing is actually larger than the other. You know, so then we have been a bit hesitant to push too far the actual number that you get from the practical. We consider more the, the significance, you know, in statistical terms. Like you don't think so much if it's big or small, but if it's very significant, then you trust it. That has been our approach so far. But it's true that it would be nice to, to for example, uh, yeah, because, for example, what we did in the DOC, data set, you have this 
hard conditions with the three conditions and you just see the correlation. So we didn't need, we couldn't use so much a degree. But uh, yeah, if you have, for example, subjects uh, under the LSD, I do a lot of work with psychedelics also, and you could have the degrees of hallucination that people are having, you could try to correlate to people more, more hallucination, have more emergence or not. That would be interesting. But uh, yeah, my, own, my only reservation would be the one I mentioned, that if this is a test approximation. But one could try to see if it works anyway. So yeah, to make the long story short, I, that's something I, I want to do. I would like to exploit the degree, but computationally it's not straightforward. I have some uh, very simple questions actually. Um, when I was wondering how do you and how do you predict the monkey's uh, hand actions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I this was done by my colleague Pedro. So I didn't do it myself, so I don't know the details, exact details, but I know it was a, um, a combination of a linear, of, uh, of list of, it was SVM, uh, support vector machine combined with, with, uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly, but, but so you had some data of the activity with the position of the hand and then use that to train, uh, Yes, so, so basically we divide the data and train and test yeah. and then you have the, the 64 time series and you have the target and then you try you you make a, a I, th I remember it was two stages and the first one I don't remember exactly how it worked the second one was a support vector machine and then basically you find uh, I think it was a non-linear non function that that shrinks the 64 into a single character and then and, and you you train that with <clears throat> some portion of the data and then you test it in another portion and then you evaluate the thing with that. So in some sense could you could one say that emergence is when your like 60 variables here can encode for a function that is of lower dimension of another variable that is of lower dimension and that has uh, I don't I don't think that would be enough because it could have been the case that the well first we did this and the first of the th thing we thought, let's just put the hand position as an emerging feature. But that is not supervenient on the data. You could maybe argue it's supervenient on the whole brain, but we didn't have the data of the whole brain, we only have those channels. So that's why we built the estimator in order to satisfy the supervenient. Then, if you run the estimator, it could have happened that the optimal prediction is just taking time series number three, and that's it. That's a possible estimator, right? And that would not have been emerging because because that is unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? So the, by, I meant by uh, having a function of the sixty variables that is not just expressed by a subset of them. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I would think that that is that's correct. That uh, what you're getting from this example is is simply saying that the mapping is very not true. And could you check if some of them were actually Redundant, like we use less in that system. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I think you could, but uh, yeah, in this example we didn't go much into details because this was the first paper where we're proposing the framework. This was just a case study to see if this makes sense and to illustrate it. But we didn't go very much in detail into the neurobiology of this. I think there could be a room for you know dimensionality reduction first and and much more processes and also try to. In the paper, really, we wanted just to show this this works and makes sense. We didn't went over the what is the biological implications or anything. So that's something that could be. I have some other very. I mean, I'm not sure I understood exactly the analysis that you did on the network. Mm -hmm. You had the network. Uh, was it like a dynamical analysis or? Um, did this part. On the, no, it was like modular versus uh, non-modular network. Uh, uh, this. Yes, yeah, yeah. This dependency on network topology. What is it? Is a dependency of what? Is a, of, this is a topology of, I mean, this is not on the left, is not the topology of the of the brain, right? Is it, It's a topology of like a, a artificial network. Or... It, so, just to recap, so we're building two networks. These two networks are this and this. Is that? 
It looks good. Okay. So we're getting an average network for for. So this is from human brain data. Yes. From the fMRI data. Or? Yes, and we get one network, two networks per subject, and then we are doing, and then we you can evaluate uh, as a network. You can build the, you can calculate the modularity of the network of each subject, mm -hmm. and then you have a cloud of points. So this is the modularity of the redundancy network for each of the subjects, and this is the, the modularity of the synergy network for each of the subjects of network. Right? So, so these two analyses are just based on the properties of these networks that are, you know, you do it over the whole time series, you get a single network, so it's not dynamic. And then this is a, you, you have, for each subject, you have the, you know, the wiring, the structural connectivity and then you can do a correlation between networks and then and this is how how different they are for each subject their own redundancy network and their own synergy network with respect to their connectors maybe one very last question so these are from the human genome therapy project there and then you had some data from like evolution uh, in, in uh, ah, monkeys. Uh, monkeys and also human yeah is that also from the human brain no. project no, no, no. Where, I don't remember. <laughs> you have to see a paper. And you have a lot of this. It's free. In the paper <laughs> I, think I think part is free. I don't know if this lights is I don't I don't know. So the I, I know that this uh, this this data is free. Yeah. That one I remember, but the one we use for this paper I, I'm not sure. I am so one okay. This is this other data set. But I have one question related to the last uh, Previous one from Claire, mm -hmm. more how to make this uh, spread to the world because the everyday users of network science they do more network analysis, the more like complexes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, related to Claire's question is how can you relate your approach with spectral theory? Because if you as soon uh, squeeze your starting point of a, a greater than parts a, a signal of your difference and stuff. Into a network and then analyze the aspect of a network, <laughs> then everyone can use it. And yes. in this slide that yeah, I just asked, it was that maybe you made it just to show a case that synergy is bigger in humans than macaque, but it has a theoretical path. Whether you think it's promising that we just put, okay, make this network is emergent, emergent, kind of things. Sorry, what, what the question is? Precisely? Yeah, so you whether it's feasible to use spectral theory to make it simple. Oh. Because you, you map your problem to a network and you will ask spectra of the network. You did that as an example, you didn't develop the theory, but <laughs> it's a network of synergy of redundance, and then whether you can find this signal in the macro and micro from the spectra of the network, then it's really straightforward in a way that will compute these. Uh, I mean, yeah, we could do it, but uh, my my feeling would be as long as clinicians can make sense of the spectrum of the network, because uh, we, we the, the nice thing of this analysis is that that tells you something very intuitive about the network. Like uh, the, the whole discussion in neuroscience about modularity versus all stuff, and all discussion about how the brain is following the physical connectome or is decoupled. So you know. So my only concern would be with the spectral approach would be and how can that be related with other discussions in whatever field because as you said the same framework can be applied to any data set you know you can have finance data set and you can run the whole pipeline and you get a redundancy to synergy gradient in there but uh, for me it's crucial how much then that can go back to the you know the specialists in that area and that will speak to them or not so as long as that can, connection can be made, and if spectral properties are relevant for these people, then of course. But uh, that, for me, the challenge is that. Do I have any other questions for anyone?